Welcome back everybody, or for the first time, if it's your first time. We live in a world of extremes. So I had the audacity to criticize Tess Holliday for her assertion that she is perfectly healthy while being morbidly obese. And obviously, I was lambasted for not equally criticizing models who are underweight and therefore tend to promote an anorexic type diet. Even though it actually is possible to be lean and skinny while still being relatively healthy, I do definitely admit that a lot of these models use really unhealthy means to maintain their kind of scary skinny figure. And these types of eating disorders can definitely be fatal. Anorexia is in fact the most fatal mental disorder. But how do these various models and the physiques that they promote affect the general population? 1 to 4.2% of women have suffered from anorexia and 4% of those women will die from complications of the disease. 4% of women have had bulimia and 3.9% of those will die from complications associated with bulimia. As we can see from these stats, generally restrictive dieting is very common common among all age groups, but restrictive dieting, while it is hellishly unsatisfying, ineffective, and unhealthy, it is not actually an eating disorder, and it carries with it little risk of death. Although I know I've put myself on some diets where I genuinely wished I was dead. If we look at the other side of the health and weight issue, we see that 68.8% .8 of adults are overweight and 34.9% of those people are obese. Here are some nice graphs giving you an idea of how those numbers break down. Now, how many of those people die because of their weight. This number is a little bit harder to tease out, but many experts believe that up to one in five premature deaths can be attributed to overweight or obesity. So that's 20% of the population dying because they're overweight or obese versus 4% of 4% dying because of anorexia or bulimia. That's a really big difference. So I think it's safe to say that this body type is much more common than this one. Not to imply that being underweight or anorexic is not miserable and it's not dangerous. But if we're going after the bigger problem, we're going after this one. But I certainly don't want to neglect people with eating disorders because, well, I mean, shit. I was one. So since I already made a whole video about how unhealthy Tess Holiday is, I will gladly equalize my criticism. It is really unhealthy to starve your body, and it is very dangerous to purge. These behaviors result in unbalanced electrolytes that can actually lead to heart failure. Under eating calories to the point of starvation can lead to heart disease, muscle wasting, life-threateningly low blood pressure, organ failure, osteoporosis, kidney failure, extreme fatigue, reproductive distress, and hair loss, just to name a few. With all of these horrible consequences, why would anyone be so terrified of calories that they actually choose to starve themselves over just nourishing their body? Oh. I see. The diet industries and modeling industries have programmed us to be petrified of calories. And money-hungry, albeit lying bloggers, seem all too happy to perpetuate that fear of calories with their ridiculously restrictive recipes and the implication that they themselves regularly subsist on 1200 to 1600 calories a day without going out of their minds and binging and purging. Liar. The one thing I will say that's going right about anorexia is that it is accurately identified as a mental disorder. And it is acknowledged that this type of eating disorder is the result of a societal sickness. I believe the exact same is true of overweight or obese people who are unable to shift their eating patterns towards one of health, especially those that are binging. Because as someone who is previously overweight and very prone to binges, I can attest that it was a problem with my head, as well as with my nutrition. And while I think that it's a good idea that we acknowledge that these problems originate from pathological societal norms, I also think that it's a huge disservice to treat these disorders purely through pharmaceutical. There is now a drug on the market specifically for the newly invented binge eating disorder. So your doctor sees you for five minutes, diagnoses you, and puts you on a pill. Then what? No addressing the root cause? No personal responsibility? Your brain is broken. 
take this pill. Side effect, weight gain. Congratulations, the pharmaceutical companies are now literally using you as a cash cow. And FYI, your nutritionally uneducated doctor gets a really nice kickback. So don't expect them to tell you the truth. But I digress. Back to the models. So as the body types of the average Americans have expanded, so too have our options for models. There are now many demographics represented, ranging from severely underweight to severely overweight. And both are pretty damn dangerous. Not that they would ever admit it. Because here's a problem. Regardless of size, models are fucking liars. At least part of the time. Tess, like many other obese individuals, claims to be healthy. I assume she and her doctor have a very different definition of health than people who were, say, not in abject denial. And even though she did have gallstones back in 2012, she still maintains that she's in perfect health. But the lying certainly doesn't stop there. If I have to watch one more dreary-eyed, slurring Brazilian girl, with a BMI of 15.3, explain to me how much she loves eating double bacon cheeseburgers. I'm going to purposefully rupture my own eardrum with a Q-tip. Trust me, I don't doubt that she loves double bacon cheeseburgers. I'm sure she fantasizes about them all day, but she hasn't had one of those in her stomach for more than three minutes since she was 11. Models severely calorie restrict. They have eating disorders. That's, like, not up for debate anymore, since so many of them have confirmed it. So how did you maintain your weight as a model? I ate tissues? Like Adriana Lima, who I chose because I was particularly obsessed with her as I was growing up and trying to starve myself into submission. Adriana Lima still claims not to have an eating disorder, but in the recent past, Miss Adriana also shared with us all her pre-Victoria's Secret fashion show dieting tips. No solid food for over nine days, twice a day extreme workouts, then she severely dehydrates her calorie-depleted body for two days before the show. Let me check my handy DSM-5. Yep, that's a fucking eating disorder. Oh my god! You might say, I would have fainted. You intuitively know. But she's not fainting. She's energetically strutting down the runway. How is that possible? All of the Victoria's Secret models, they said, we eat. We have to eat to have energy. So how are they so energetic even though they're not eating and they're severely dehydrated? Hmm? It's probably because before the show, they just hoovered like three eight balls worth of cocaine. Trust me, a lot more people are doing cocaine than you think are doing cocaine. And in addition to whatever amount of cocaine she hoovered up her nose right before the show, I'm sure that the weeks prior were a narcotic implosion. Adderall, caffeine, blow, cigarettes, alcohol, and Ambien. Because it takes a lot to keep a starving brain and body under control while still being moderately functional. Drug and alcohol abuse, along with caloric restriction, are never without cognitive and physical consequences. We know this. And so help me God, if you say the G word, I will lose it. It's all just, it's all genetic. She has skinny genes. Everyone in my family is overweight. It's genetic. Look, we're all human beings. We are all essentially genetically identical. We all evolved to conserve calories because we came about with scarcity and starvation as reality. I have never met or heard about a single person that can eat whatever they want and not gain weight. I've met people with hidden eating disorders. I've met people who secretly abuse drugs. I've met people who chain smoke and make themselves eat crushed ice cubes for lunch. But I've never met anyone who was at their ideal weight and in ideal health and who wasn't conscious about what they were eating. Google epigenetics. What you eat affects how your genes express themselves. But it's more than the models and geneticists who have lied to and misled us. The diet industry tells us that in order to lose weight, we have to restrict our calories. Many of the most popular diet and weight loss gurus tell us to restrict our carbohydrates and increase amounts of protein and saturated fat in the diet. Many others recommend using stimulants, diet pills, and appetite suppressants, and other gimmicks to try and help us with the caloric restriction. The diet works, they say if you only stick to it. Oh, I bet it does. 
The only problem is that you've now given a human being a diet that is impossible to stick to. You will never, ever, ever be able to naturally or healthfully restrict your calories below what a human being needs to function. Your brain won't let you. You will binge. Binge like crazy, and then you'll be disappointed, and you'll gain the weight back, and then you'll restrict calories more, and then you'll binge again, and then you'll gain it all back, and then you'll restrict calories more, and you'll feel so out of control, and then you'll go and see your doctor, and he'll be like, oh, you have binge eating disorder. Here, have a pill. Dieter for life. Some other people have a whole other level of cognitive fracture, and they actually just stop eating. They become extremely obsessed with food, calories, control, and trying to make themselves disappear. And while this problem is also generally initially triggered by some external weight loss goal, make no mistake, the root cause is deeply psychological, and it wouldn't matter what strung out Adriana Lima looks like on the runway, or how many custom pairs of lace thongs Tess Holliday has had fashioned, women will still starve or overfeed themselves because they are psychologically deprived of meaningful connection in our vapid, consumption-plagued culture. All I'm trying to do is make sure that people are fully informed of the consequences of the choices that they're making, so they can consent to the future that they are creating for themselves. Because when you achieve or try to maintain a weight that is severely under or over what is healthfully ideal, please, please, be assured there will be catastrophic health consequences for you down the line. One isn't worse than the other, just more common. They're both inarguably horrid. So don't waste your time trying to vilify one or the other. There are much, much more proactive behaviors to be engaging in. In either case, I think it is absolutely vital for recovery from both obesity and under eating or restrictive behavior to teach those afflicted about eating real healthy food. As a person who has been both over and underweight and suffered from the severe restriction of anorexia, the violent purges of bulimia, and the out of control self-hatred of binge eating disorder, I can attest to the absolute importance of learning to feed myself again. But if I had been taught to eat a restrictive version of the standard American diet or some kind of low-carb diet, I can guarantee you that I would still be trapped in that miserable cycle of trying to restrict calories, losing it, binging, and gaining weight. It feels so hopeless. I was lucky though, because I was exposed to another type of lifestyle, one that was about abundance, health, and eating as much as I want. I learned from an amazing community of doctors, nutritional researchers, and seriously passionate health pioneers. I learned that food and calories do not have to be feared, restricted, or otherwise controlled. I learned that food didn't need to rule my every thought, and that I didn't have to go to elaborate lengths to keep my ravenous appetite under control. I also began to understand Understand what it meant to love my body because I stopped viewing my body and the calories it craved as the enemy. Instead, I began to nourish myself with delicious health-promoting food. And the result? I actually stopped obsessing about food and started enjoying it. I stopped hating my body and started appreciating how strong and resilient it is. I stopped comparing myself to erroneous beauty ideals and started recognizing my own inherent beauty. I stopped associating my worth with my weight. And as a totally unexpected but welcome result, I actually did lose weight. And it was an effortless, easy, craving-free process. I also managed to reverse my hypothyroid, heal my chronic cystic acne, improve my digestion, and join tens of thousands of people who have done the same. If you want more information, please explore my videos, but I have nothing to sell you. Sorry. I believe our obsession with weight and beauty ideals is actually an obsession with wanting to feel happy, accepted, and worthy. Please know, your weight has nothing to do with these feelings but your health and well-being definitely do. Make those your priority and forget about all of these irresponsible, shitty role models that don't care about themselves, let alone you, and make 
better choices for yourself. No one else is going to do it. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to rate and subscribe below. I'm also thoroughly looking forward to the comments. So until next time, go vegan. I said it. I was all like, I'm not going to say the V word in this video, but I have to. Going vegan is the best choice ever. Once you try it, you totally understand why vegans talk about it all the time. It's because we have tons of energy, feel amazing, and veganism can totally revolutionize your health, it can save billions of animals from being tortured, and it can reverse the environmental destruction that's literally going to kill everyone. Okay, I'm done.